I think I think we're online. Hello and welcome to this webinar. We're just gonna wait a few seconds for all the people to sign sign up. Um, in case you want, you're wondering, I wanted to see Steve, but this is not Steve. My name is Kai Kristen. Um, I'm the founder of the Lifestyle Design Convention, a coach and sales trainer. And I had the crazy idea to put an event together um, with a lot of coaches. And one of them, actually the most famous one, of course, is Steve Pavlina. Hi, Steve. Hello. And yeah, we're going to have around, uh, we're just going to roll with uh, around 60 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about um, your path with a heart. That's the topic of the, of the webinar that we're going to do. And yeah, we're just going to roll from there. It's all a little bit experimental, but uh, we already had a lot of fun <laughs> in the preparation for it. And we're going to continue with this flow. So Steve, my first question for you would be, uh, you, you said you, you're going to speak at the Lifestyle Design Convention about your path with a heart. And my question to you is, why? <laughs> why? Um, one thing I've been seeing a lot is that when people get out of school and they go into the corporate world and get a job, mm -hmm. initially there's a lot of excitement about it, but then the reality sinks in. And they realize that the path that they're on after a certain number of years is just not that exciting or inspiring to them anymore. They're just basically working to make other people wealthier. They're doing work that may be re very repetitive or boring. And the longer they pursue that path, the more you see this heart-centeredness, this excitement, this passion drained out of them. Mm -hmm. So that as they get older and older, they just seem more and more uh, disconnected with their life. It's like all that, that youthful energy that passion is gone. And I've been noticing that um, people often at some point hit a, a time where they just want to make a major lifestyle change. And they become so much happier after they do that, when they let go of all these things from the past. And that's, that's something I've gotten really inspired about, reconnecting with myself and wanting to help other people reconnect with, is how do you make sure that your, your life is something that you really enjoy as you live it? and not this, this thing that becomes a, a burden or an obligation or where your whole life is just about work, work, work all the time. Um, you know, we're only here on this earth for a certain number of decades and then we're gone. And I think it makes sense to enjoy your time here, you know, among doing other things. And what a tragedy it is to go your whole life and never really find the joy, the joy and the, uh, the passion on that, on that path yeah. that you're on. What do you think, Why? like, I mean, we have people from all over the world signed up. I mean, we have people from India uh, that are listening to this. We have people from Russia, people from Europe. So it seems to be a problem all over the world that people really, or, or an interest all over the world, that people really want to live the life of their dreams, as, as we call it. And why do you think are so many people not doing what they really would love to do? I think it's that the the you know we got on this industrial age model of living, where <laughs> yeah. people were basically turned into cogs for factories, and a lot of our educational system became aligned with that. Factories needed a lot of labor; they needed a lot of workers, and so people were basically trained to 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 work you know in one job, one career for many many years. One of the things that's waking people up now is you know, having the internet and having new possibilities. Now they're realizing the world is changing so quickly. There's so many new opportunities, you know, coming out there. People are often hearing stories about, you know, friends in their 20s suddenly becoming very rich uh, or just, you know, people going a, a digital nomad lifestyle route and traveling all around while blogging or podcasting or making videos from the road or doing speaking and having these amazing lifestyles. And they're starting to ask, well, why not me? You know, why don't I get to participate in that too? Why do I have to just go to this job I don't even like each day when all these other things I'm getting reminded of that, you know, now they're possible? I think that's one of the reasons, you know, there's this current awakening process is that now we have so many more opportunities available to us. We don't have to have that, um, that local job anymore. You know, the, and the path that our parents took, at least my parents' generation, of having one stable job with the same company 
for 30 plus years, you know, a path that each of my parents did, that worked in, in their generation. And now we're expected to have many, many career changes in our lifetime and being able to you know, twist and pivot and turn and, and you think you have that stable job and then your company downsizes and you're gone. You know, now that the pace of technological innovation is so quick that you have a job for 10 years and you think you're on a stable path and then boom, your industry is now completely obsolete. You know, look, at, look at what happened, for instance, with encyclopedia companies. Um, <laughs> you know, companies that were making these physical print books, these giant encyclopedias collections. And then, boom, you know, obsolete when uh, CD-ROMs and the internet come about. So, you know, the in industries are changing so fast. It's really fascinating to me to see how technology has enabled such a such a, a shift in people away mm -hmm. from that that factory mindset. Plus, with automation now, that whole stable job is that whole model is basically threatened. You have to adapt much more quickly to any kind of career path you're on. It's hard to name a field in which you could pick a stable career path and still expect that it's going to be valid in 30 or 40 years. But that sounds like a really crazy or like a really, how should I say, scary thing for a lot of people, I think. And um, how, should, how should people approach this situation that they have right now? I mean, there, as you said, there is a lot of uncertainty out there so much uncertainty about your career path about everything like and at the same time you have so many options especially like in Switzerland where where we are located at the moment you have all this opportunity so people are even in a much more luxurious situation so they can pick from whatever they want but they still don't there's still uh, a lot of times in that corporate uh, yeah, in that corporate environment where they think, well, I, I need my paycheck at the end of the month. I really need that. I, I think that, that's what I'm here for. And at the same time, they want to, I, I mean, I have these conversations all the time where these people say, well, but I would like to do that, but I cannot do it. I mean, I, I cannot make money out of it, you know? So uh, what do you say to those people? Well, you can resist change. And yeah. that's gonna that's going to drive you into a fear fear place and trying to make you hunker down and secure what you have and trying to you know uh, subscribe to this illusion of long term certainty. Mm -hmm. But that's not very effective. So one of the things you can do there is wake up to the truth that that's just going to blind you to all the risk that you're actually taking on. That when you get that stable job in many career fields, and it seems stable and it seems like something that can't be threatened, it is not secure. It is not really a secure path because any business can be threatened, any industry can be threatened uh, by, by technology. So you know, one of the things to do is first accept the truth, accept that that's just the nature of reality that change is accelerating. Mm -hmm. And if you resist that, then you're, you're taking yourself just out of alignment with truth. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to turn your back on what's actually happening, on things you can see with your own eyes and things that other people are experiencing. If you do, then you put yourself in a victim place. You know, then you're just setting yourself up for a future layoff, a future setback, uh, you know, finding yourself obsolete in your 50s and not knowing what to do. It's, it's really sad in a way how many emails I get from people in their 50s who have gotten laid off following a career path they thought was stable and secure, and now they're laid off and they're in their 50s and they, they don't know what to do because they feel like they've, they've invested so much in a line of work that is no longer needed. And, uh, you know, say like an encyclopedia salesperson. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Wikipedia put them out of business, and now they're, well, what do I do? What do I do on this path? Um, the second option, instead of, you know, turning your back on truth, is to fall in love with the pace of change is to feel the excitement of it, feel that sense of opportunity that all these changes are creating so many wonderful opportunities and that there's constantly these new waves of energy being created. And if you take the attitude of being a surfer where, okay, maybe I missed that last wave, but there's always another wave coming. And if you, all you have to do is catch your wave, the one that feels aligned with your path with the heart, the one that excites you and ride that for a while. But know that eventually that wave is going to burn out. Its energy will you know, ride you to the shore, and you've got to swim out and catch another one. 
and realize that no wave is permanent. No wave of energy is is the whole. It's the point is not to catch that wave and cling to it for dear life and ride it all the way to your deathbed. Yeah. The point is to keep keep surfing, keep going out and catching another wave and another wave and another wave, and to fall in love with being competent as a surfer of that type of energy, as a surfer of change. I know, for instance, that the path I'm on of say blogging as my primary uh, media is eventually going to burn out. You know, I started blogging just over 10 years ago. In fact, October 1st was my 10-year anniversary of my blog. Congratulations to that, my friend. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but when I started, when I started, I thought I was getting into the field a little bit on the late side because there were already 8 million blogs out there reportedly when I, when I began in 2004. And little did I know that just a couple years later it would be in the hundreds of millions of blogs and that blogging was going to explode. So I caught that wave of blogging early on. But now I see, you know, when people ask me, um, hey, should I get into blogging today? I say no. You know, that wave is kind of really mature now and it's it's almost to the beach as far as I could, I could say. If I were starting today, I would not start with blogging. I would start with something else, maybe online video. But probably if I were starting out today, I would look at it and say, what are the big waves that are rising right now? I'd say, you know, I'd say it's probably apps, like mobile apps are really taking off. Online services, you know, like websites and things like that that do useful things for people. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the big waves that are coming out now. There's all kinds of other technology waves and there's all kinds of other social waves that are coming out. One of the big waves I see in new businesses is uh, cuddling professionally. You know, people are making eight thousand, ten thousand dollars a month as professional cuddlers now. <laughs> where, where, where you would, and there's even a there's even a, a one day certification program you can take in the, in the UK now to become a certified professional cuddler. <laughs> I think if you uh, you know Google like professional cuddler, you'll you'll find uh, those websites. I think so, there will be many more hits now on professional cuddling websites right now in this. <laughs> yeah. So so it's. You know, the waves are not always technology-based. You don't have to be a programmer or an engineer, although um, I was a programmer for many years, so I don't, I, I'm fine catching waves that align a bit with technology. I don't mind that. Uh, but if people are not comfortable aligning with those kinds of waves, techno technological changes cause all kinds of social ripples, too. And, and social changes can cause technology changes as well, like we see with the rise of social media. Um, so you can align yourself with any of these kinds of waves, and that I see as a much better approach to turning your back on truth and trying to be like a turtle hunkering down in your shell. In instead, you know, think of think of yourself being as more of a surfer of these waves of energy. Yeah. And the more of them you catch and you ride to shore, the better you get at surfing. So, so I, I knew when I started blogging ten years ago, eventually this medium will die out and it'll be obsolete. And I, I'm already starting to see signs of that. In fact, I'm, you know, I tend to go in each field that I've been in in the past for about 10 years. And so I may even start transitioning to something else, whatever feels like it's rising up for me right now. Um, and and that excites me, because when that energy wave is is getting, you know, taking you to shore, you might find that it's time for something new. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you can uh, stop being so clingy with your past and stop seeking security where you're not going to find it. So, so you've you've been talking about riding those waves, and one question um, I think Yokoi uh, is his or her name. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, is asking. So, Steve, are you basically saying that no one should work a full time job? That was her question. Yeah, not at all. I have I have a number of friends that love their full time jobs. They tend to work in the tech fields. Like uh, I know one guy at Microsoft, he's a program manager there, and he, while he's tempted to go independent, he tells me how much he loves the ability to connect with such smart people in such a variety of fields. Mm -hmm. What working at Microsoft has done for him, has, he's just said it's been amazing lifestyle-wise. So he's, he says, you know, I, I see the lack of freedom in the sense that he has to go to you know, an office each day and show up to work there. But he finds the environment so stimulating, he absolutely loves and enjoys it. So no, I think it's absolutely fine to, to get a job, and I see a number of people that do. But you constantly see these surveys that show that 80% of people who have jobs don't like them. And so I'm, you know, when I write articles about that, I'm talking more to that 80%. The 20% who like their jobs, when I say you should never get a job, they're just going to ignore me. 
which is what I expect. But it's the ones where it gets under their skin and goes, Ugh, you know, he's kind of right. I don't really like my job. I hate this place. And why am I coming here each day? And I should be doing something different. And I feel like my life is just slipping away from me. That then why, you know, why do they continue doing that? And usually it's just fear. It's a lack of confidence in themselves, lack of willingness to try something different, and lack of a lack of willingness to admit the truth to themselves that that path work they're on, it has no heart. It has no passion. It has no energy. Yeah. So it's, let's say let's say somebody, so let's say somebody is in that dead end, um, but maybe doesn't know yet. Uh, like, what else should I do with my life? I'm just like completely in that in that zone of like my nine to five job. Uh, how do you tell people like uh, how do they find out what do, what really makes them happy or what they should do in life? Usually. Usually what people don't want to hear is the most obvious advice, which is if the path you're on is not making you happy, then stop walking down that path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like if, it, if the job you're going to each day is making you miserable, um, stop showing up to it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, once you clear that out, once you stop walking down the wrong path, give yourself mm -hmm. some time, to, 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 to stop doing that, even if you have to have your whole life collapse around you and lose a bunch of your stuff to make it happen. Clear that space out, then you finally have a chance to start walking down you know, some other path. So, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's this um, tendency to distract ourselves when the path that we're on right now is not the one that's fulfilling us. And when people keep on that path with a job, I find that that's really a slow track. And usually what happens for them to get off that path is they withdraw so much from their work that they end up getting fired or laid off because mm -hmm. they're not really contributing that much. If they're not really that excited about their work, they're basically robbing their employer. You know, they're not really doing their best. What, what's the point of doing a job if you're not going to do your best? You know, pick something else where you will do your best, something that motivates you. After they clear out that energy, after they let go of that path that's not inspiring them, then they finally um, have the ability to concentrate on something different. And of course, there's the motivation to get something going to start making some money, um, you know, doing something different. But as long as that old path is distracting them constantly, usually I find that people just don't have the time and the resources to, to make a change. If they're constantly showing up to the old path each day, uh, I rarely see those people succeed in making a transition. They'll start and they'll stop and they'll start and they'll stop and they'll, they'll drag it on for five more years, ten more years, and they're always saying, yeah, I'll quit my job eventually. Uh, and it's not just about jobs. People do this in their relationships too. You know, I've seen people go eight, ten years saying they're going to break up with a partner because uh, that place is called ambivalence, you know, where I don't, you know, should I stay or should I go? And if you know you're an ambivalence, then the correct solution is usually just get out. If you've been in an ambivalence for that long and all your best efforts to figure it out or transition are not working, it's time to stop walking on the old path. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's the, it's like you cannot come into a place of creativity of of creating something if if you if you're still in the old patterns. It just doesn't work. It's it's also on the micro level like that. I see a lot of people that get their creative thoughts not when they're actually working but when they're in the gym or when they're taking a shower or they do something completely or me two hours ago when <laughs> I decided to take Janina on board as a moderator I was in the sauna doing something completely else uh, uh, different and I think that's really important that you have like this space where you can start creating something new so I can completely agree with that let's say you have a passion um, you know what you want to do. You you created that space and you actually got this idea. Um, but you think like, well, how will I make money out of it, right? Or how will I how will I finance my lifestyle and still do the thing that I love? Um, do you have any inputs for those kind of people? Yeah, I mean, I I focused on trying to make money my first five years in business in my early twenties. From uh, 1994 to 1998, my focus was on running a computer games business and trying to make money. 
and I started I, I started with twenty thousand dollars cash that I had my life savings up to that point, which I made doing some consulting work before that. And I poured it into the business and I went through that twenty thousand dollars in six months and blew through it all and then ended up one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt and going bankrupt. That was how trying to make money worked out for me. <laughs> so I thought, okay, that I put all my best efforts and I thought I was a fairly bright guy. I had good programming skills. I had you know a, a double major in computer science and mathematics. I thought I'm a bright guy, I'm smart, I can figure this out. All I gotta do is focus on making money and I will make money. Had the exact opposite effect. And I see other people going through it, that same kind of struggle. Trying to make money has the exact opposite effect. One of the reasons nobody cares that you're trying to make money, I don't care that you're trying to make money. That doesn't inspire me to help you. It doesn't inspire other people around you to help you and support you. But what is it that actually makes you money? It's other people giving you money, right? So if you want to make money, you need other people to support you by giving you money for something. Why are they going to do that? Is your trying to make money going to inspire them to open up their wallets and say, oh, really? You want money? Great. Here you go. You know, They don't care. They're going to hold on to their money or you're going to find it very difficult, or you're going to go down this path of a very manipulative dark worker type and, and try to you know, trick, uh, trick people into giving you their money with all, you know, all kinds of emotional manipulation techniques. All that's completely, un un completely unnecessary, though, if instead you simply flip your mindset and say, okay, if I want people to give me money, then maybe I should find a way to earn it, to deserve their money. So maybe I should find out what people would like in exchange for their money. What can I do to help people? What can I do them to make a difference there? And that requires kind of letting go of that focus on you know me, 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 and think of money as more of a, a social tool. If you want money to flow through you, it's all about relationships. You know, it's an exchange of value. Somebody's giving you you know their money in exchange for something from you. Focus first then on creating a lot of value for other people. If you can get good at that, then you will have lots and lots of abundance. That's why um, when I started my blogging business, for the first six months, I didn't monetize it at all. I just put out lots and lots of articles for free, and I've been doing that for years. I put about 30 books worth of free content, um, you know, about, about 2 million words of free content in the past 10 years just putting it out there. It's my way of just practicing and creating value for other people. And whenever I do that, when I focus on that side, the money is really easy to make. It really flows well. Because you're doing the very thing that inspires people to want to give back, to want to help you. Now, in the case of like just starting out, so with my games business, how did I do that? Because I, I know it's kind of unfair to say, okay, first build you know a blog that gets millions of visitors a month, and then you'll have no problem, problem making money. So let's say you're starting with zero traffic, which is like where I was with my games business. What did I do? Well, I I created some little games on the side just based on you know me being a programmer wanting to create a game to try to make money. That got me up to about three hundred dollars a month after five years. <laughs> not very not very effective, not very successful. So instead, I thought, all right, well maybe if I want to make a game that makes money, I should find out what people want. So what I did is I went to a bunch of game download sites and I looked at different game categories and I saw, okay, what are the download numbers? Like what are the top 10 games that people are downloading in each category? Like action games, arcade games, puzzle games. And then I, I aligned that also with asking the question of what could I create that people want? So I was, I was basically looking for a market gap. Where are there lots of download numbers showing a lot of demand and where are there... Um, possible gaps where I could create some kind of game that would be really interesting that people would enjoy and that would align with what they're looking for. So I went through different categories and I saw, huh, the puzzle game category looks really good in that it had a lot of downloads and a lot of crappy games in it. And I, I saw the top 10 there and I was like, you know, I, I can make a better game than what's there. Uh, at least a, something that would be more fun, more creative, more interesting. There was a lot of junk being downloaded, though, so people were obviously looking for puzzle games, but there wasn't that much out there that I thought that was really, really interesting and good and original. A lot of it was just clones of other games, match three games and Tetris clones and um, you know all the all these uh, just ripoffs of games copying each other. It wasn't much originality there. So I thought, hmm, okay, it's clear people want puzzle games, and it's clear I could make something that would satisfy them. So that's that's the area I targeted and took six months to write a game 
for that category that was very original, started with a whole, you know, a new design, not copying any other game, and it went off to win Shareware Game of the Year two years in a row, and uh, very quickly got me to five thousand dollars a month, and then helping to leverage it and doing gold versions. You know, pretty soon my business was up to twenty thousand dollars a month from three hundred dollars a month. Um, just focusing on what could I do to make a difference in people's lives, and that was just you know writing entertainment software. Um, that really, really works. If you get good at providing value for people, um, and that requires figuring out what people are looking for, what they want, and aligning with what you can provide, you're not going to have so much of a problem financially. You're always going to you're always be able to look for those um, those gaps in the market. What can you do? And that's the cool thing about change that we were talking about earlier, is that all these ripples and and changes, especially the ones that are, that are created by technology, are constantly opening up, opening up new gaps and new opportunities for people. And so there's, there's, there's tons and tons of gaps out there that people could be targeting. That's one of the reasons the cuddle businesses are taking off right now. People are spending so much time on social media, they're not going out as much, they're not, you know, they're not, they're not connecting with friends face to face in person, they're just sitting behind their laptops all the time. And as they get older especially, they, they start feeling more and more disconnected. Our, uh, you know, our, our process of cocooning ourselves in our own private homes with our computers and our technology links to the outside world is making us crave touch more. And so you become a professional cuddler who's really good at making people feel loved through touch. Boom, you just sit around in your pajamas all day and people show up and cuddle you and you, you, know, you make $60, $80 an hour doing that. It, it, you know, and it's, it's targeting, again, it's targeting a gap. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do, do people come up with that when they say, I need money, I need money, I need to figure out how to make money? They usually don't get those kinds of ideas, but the ideas don't have to be that complicated. How difficult is it to put up a five-page website with some, you know, your rates for cuddling and, and start getting clients and, you know, get referrals from that, and within a matter of months, you've got yourself a professional cuddling business making thousands of dollars a month. Absolutely. It's, again, about the initial idea that you have, and you will not get it if you're in that wheel where you just like feel bad and where you're just in this dead end street you will probably not get the idea you have to free yourself first and then you will get such a such an insight Steve if you allow me I will um, ask a few questions from our um, from our attendees um, by the way calling that, by there's lots and lots of questions coming through faster than <laughs> yeah yeah and I'm like getting slowly nervous I'm like oh so many so many questions, and there, like, there is a mysterious girl somewhere here. Uh, her name is Yanina. Probably a lot of uh, you guys already met her through the chat. Um, she's not connected via audio um, <laughs> due to some technical difficulties, but we will try to get in some questions um, from people uh, that she wrote me right now. So one question that I've seen like uh, going through was like, what if you're like still a really young dude or a young girl and you're just from high school, where should you start? That was one of the questions. It, age doesn't really matter. I, I don't see how age is relevant. Um, I mean, there's people who start on this path as teenagers. There's people who start on this path in their 50s, 60s, 70s. It doesn't really matter. Um, start start where, where you like. So I, I would say at that age, start thinking about what kind of skill set you want to bet big on eventually. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways you can increase the value that you provide for others is find at least one skill that aligns with what you like and also that society has clearly demonstrated there is a market demand for, that people are willing to pay for. One of the problems, and I did see a question flash by about this earlier, one of the problems that comes up a lot is that people bet big on skill sets that just don't pay very well, unless they go a certain direction. Uh, for example, they'll get really good at playing a certain musical instrument, but they have no idea how to make money doing it. Mm -hmm. And the market has clearly demonstrated that they're just not paying that much for it, or it's hugely competitive, or there's a lot of risk. And so you have to get really, really, really good at it, or maybe have some lucky breaks along the way. And I'm not trying to talk people out of getting into music or anything like that, but look at, look at what society is already telling you about that path and decide, do I want to accept that risk profile? Okay, so if you want to go the professional music route, know that that's a very risky route. 
If on the other hand you say, well, okay, I want to have a little more secure guarantee that I'm going to get paid well on this on this skill set that I'm, I'm going to bet big on developing, then maybe pick something that society is demonstrating that you're more likely to get paid really well doing it, say professional speaking or programming or engineering or lately anything having to do with computer security. <laughs> anything in that field, it's hard to make less than six figures a year doing it because society is basically saying, we need this, <laughs> and it's, it's making it clear that, that there's a lot of money being spent in that area. There's a lot of demand for it. Uh, so, so when you're starting out, start looking for an alignment between what excites you, what inspires you, and what society is going to pay for. It's going to pay a lot for it. That's assuming you want to have a good income down the road. Let's say you want to make $10,000 a month or more. And pick a skill set so that society is showing clearly that will make that much money. You know, being an entrepreneur, being a programmer, being an, uh, being a writer, you can make that much. Being a musician, sure you can. Being an artist, yes you can. Some some of those areas are riskier than others, though. I got lucky in that the first skill set I picked when I was 10 years old, programming. I picked it just because I loved it. I didn't know that it was going to be something that would potentially pay well later in life. And other friends that had fallen into a certain path, they picked a skill set to develop earlier in life. I found out that many of them just made a tiny fraction of what I was making once I got going you know, on that path um, because th the market just wasn't demanding it that much. Even in college, I was able to make uh, $50 an hour as a programmer before I'd even graduated w with, with a skill set that I'd been developing since I was 10 years old. That was just a lucky pick, a lucky break. But later on when I realized that different, you know, that alignment there, I thought, okay, what other skill sets do I would I like to develop and would align with being able to generate income? And there's other skill sets I would love to get good at, but I just don't see how they're going to pay. Like I love disc golf. I play, you know, it's basically golf played with uh, frisbee discs. And I play pretty much every week and I've been playing for many, many years. And I'm, I'm an okay player at it. I'm not a professional or anything like that. There's a part of me, though, that thinks it would be really fun to bet big on disc golf and to become a really good disc golfer. But I just don't see that much money in the field. I don't see how me getting good at disc golf provides much value for other people. So if I do bet big on that, it's just going to depress my income later. It means crowding out something else that I could develop. So instead of choosing to bet big on disc golf, I said, all right, I'm going to develop skill as a public speaker. And then if I wanted to, I could make you know, a good bit of money um, as a speaker. For instance, my last workshop I did in August, uh, the ticket sales were $65,000 for a three-day event. That's not bad you know, to, to be able to earn that much money as a public speaker. But I, I started developing those skills 10 years ago you know, in, in earnest, and that was the intention because I knew that, that area paid well. So that's you, something to think about when you're when you're young, especially, is like what are the what are the skill sets I'd love to develop that I would enjoy and that society will pay for. So if you if you find one of those skill sets, right, uh, that you think society is willing to pay for, one question was, um, I, Elish, Elisheva <laughs> asked uh, whether you would recommend getting a loan to start that. Would I recommend getting a loan? Yes. Depends on, on how much risk you can handle. Um, I did that. I financed my early business with credit cards, and it just ended up going leading to bankruptcy. So I, I decided when I started my personal development business 10 years ago not to get any financing or loans and not to even spend money uh, unless I absolutely had to. Um, oftentimes, having too much money is a bad thing. Uh, I feel like I probably would have done a, a better job with my computer games business if I didn't have $20,000 to start with. Maybe if I only had 1000 or less, it probably would have been better because I would have learned to be, to be leaner. Um, if you get a loan, there's a tendency to you know, waste and burn the money too much. Mm -hmm. Like I was doing things like buying a $700 photocopy machine. I really didn't need to make many photocopies. <laughs> you know, I could have taken things to a copy store and had copies made for pennies if I really needed, you know, needed them occasionally. So mostly I just had the $700 piece of equipment sitting in the corner of my office that I didn't need. 
And I got a, I got an outside office. I was paying rent outside the home, and then you have to commute to that too, and get insurance, and it's you know, and it, the expenses can really pile up. With my personal development business, I started that ten years ago for a whopping investment of nine dollars just to register the domain name. That's all I was willing to spend. Everything after that had to come out of profits from the business or revenue, basically. So you know, if I can start a business that makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with nine dollars. I'll do that, and I would much rather start leaner. So, um, but you know, as to whether it's a good idea to get a loan, it depends on what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. but how, how solid your plan is for paying it back? There's no one size fits all answer to that. In my case, I love starting a new business with no no financing whatsoever, because you can start a business with pretty much pocket change now, especially an online business. I'm just going. I'm just browsing through the questions, and I'm trying to figure out which one fits the best. And next, um, there are so many, <laughs> but, uh, which, is, you know that. which is good. At, at the uh, same time, also uh, quite overwhelming. Um, we have another one. Is uh, what is the first step on? Well, we we answered that kind of. But what is the first step on taking the path with the heart, and how do you know you are? I think that's an interesting one. How do you know you are on track? or in alignment with heart? Uh, my general rule for that, so I'll take the second part of that first. Yes. I know you're on the path. If you have doubts and you're really not sure, I'd say you're probably not on the path. <laughs> um, generally, when I'm on that path, it's very clear to me that I'm on that path. I'm just I'm loving it. One of, one of the telltale signs I, I use is I am excited to get out of bed each morning. When I wake up in the morning, I'm like, ready to start my day. There's not this part of me that feels like, oh, I just, I just want to sleep in. If I have that feeling like I just want to sleep in, then I know I'm really not on that path of the heart at the mm -hmm. moment, or I'm, I'm losing sight of it. If I wake up excited and want to just dive into doing something, that's, that's when I really know I'm on that path. Uh, you know, unless, unless you're maybe hungover or something, <laughs> or you were staying up late and just didn't get enough sleep. But uh, that, that excitement to, to start my day, to get on with it, to, to get moving, uh, it, it tends to be more of an emotional thing, you know, a, a feeling. How do you how do you get started on that? It depends. If you have a clear idea, then just start moving on it. If you don't have a clear idea, take your best guess and just get moving. You're go you're going to figure out your path with a heart, not by standing still and analyzing it. I I've been guilty of you know standing still and doing endless journaling and planning, and that's just not how I find the path with a heart. It, uh, you don't generally plan it out and in, in detail so much sitting still and being in that place of analysis paralysis. It, it can align with planning, but then the planning is exciting itself because you're just planning out the details of what you already want to be doing. One of the telltale ways I know what my path with the heart is is I ask what scares me. What am I afraid to do? Or what do I feel like I can't do? That part of me keeps thinking about. One of the things I've been I've been looking at is um, selling my house and just traveling around the world for a few years, and that I feel is a path of the heart for me. It seems mm -hmm. really exciting, but there's all these reasons I can't do it, and and yet it keeps coming up for me. It keeps coming up, and I talk to my girlfriend about it. She loves the idea and really wants to do it, but yet there's all these reasons I can't do it. And everybody I talk to about it, they're like, Yeah, yeah, I can tell you want to do that, and you should just go do that. So I'm thinking, hmm, okay. And then I find when I start leaning to that with action, like I start downsizing my possessions, which I did a bit of the, the past week, um, you know, setting aside items to donate to charity, cleaning up my garage uh, to, as if I'm getting ready to sell the house. I start getting excited, and it feels really easy and flowing. That's one of the ways I know I've, I've found that path. But I have to guess a lot, and sometimes I guess wrong. And if you choose the wrong path, it's okay because you're going to know it by how you feel. You're going to feel this, like, Mm, th this this lack of feeling of, of alignment. Usually when you start following that path with the heart, what you feel is some kind of emotional lightness or relief, people often say. A lot, of, a lot of times when people quit their jobs, what I hear them say is they feel very relieved. Like, I feel so relieved I don't have to go back to that job today. Even if there's all this fear and scariness, they, that feeling of relief is even stronger. Mm-hmm. They have to take action first, though, to make that feeling of relief happen. And that's the scary part, mostly, to, mm -hmm. to stop that job or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. 
let me go uh, because I have like five screens. <laughs> okay. um, what what I'm interested in is one one thing. So you said like okay, when whenever you feel like you wake up and you feel amazing about what you're doing, you're on the path. And I was asking myself like I'm organizing this event, this lifestyle design convention. Sometimes I woke up and I wasn't in a like amazing mood to to work on it. And I, at the same time, I felt like I need to do it anyways. And I, I knew that it's something that excites me completely on a bigger scale. But just it, like sometimes you don't feel like doing something. Like how do you create the focus on like doing things every day or doing things on a regular basis? Even if you're like you're not that like no boss is looking over your shoulder, for example, for all the entrepreneurs. Sure, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question, because on one sense we have that macro level path with a heart, that long path, and we, we know, uh, you know when we're on that path, we know we're heading in the right general direction, but even in, in, when we're still moving in that direction, on the shorter span, like the span of a, a day or a week or so, we can feel out of alignment with it, like we've gotten off the path somehow, even though we feel we're moving in the right general direction. And usually when I, when I catch myself succumbing to that, I notice it's a. I've changed my priorities too much. I've started shifting to um, like a need for security, or I'm trying to make money, or I'm I'm thinking in ways that just don't inspire me, and it's all my own doing. And so what I do is I create a simple practice for putting myself back into alignment. And I, I encourage everybody to do this: is come up with your 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 simplest, most atomic level practice of what you can do to get yourself back aligned with your path with a heart that, that, that is part of your bigger path. So what I do in that situation is my, my little atom of realignment is to simply write a new article to provide some value for other people and not to write from a place of, oh, I want to see if I can get traffic here or, oh, um, I'm going to try to uh, you know get really good search rank rankings with this piece or anything like that. Nothing selfish at all. Just put yourself in the place of some kind of pure selfless service. At least that's what works for me. Like I just want to do some good for somebody out there in the world. And as soon as I write that, as, as soon as I start writing that piece, I feel good. I start feeling better. It raises my vibe back up again. Um, I'm just focusing on giving and just contributing, putting some value out there in the world. And when I publish it and I, you know, post it, it feels good. I and I, I feel like I've lifted myself back out of that pit of uh, of uh, misalignment. And if I have to do that again, you know, for a few days in a row, I will. But that usually just doing that once brings me back into alignment. I find that other people often have that same kind of thing, a simple act of service, an act of kindness. I know I know somebody who when, when she feels that way, she'll go through the Starbucks drive through and she'll pay for the drink for her and the person behind her too. You know, so she'll, she, like who, and so the person gets to the register in their window and the the you know, cashier says, Oh, your drink is free. And, uh, you know, because of the woman in front of her paid for it. So it's a nice little act of a, a kindness anonymously. For some people, it could just be, you know, giving a, a little donation to charity makes them feel good again. Um, that Having some simple practice that you can do again and again and again to remind yourself to get back onto that path with a heart, that really helps. Um, on, a, on a bigger scale... If you find you're taking too many days off that path with a heart, ask what your priorities are. Ask why you're doing something. I find that when I'm when I'm getting in that mindset of doing something just for myself or because I think I need money or I'm trying to get ahead, I'm taking some kind of competitive posture, then I lose that alignment. When I just get back to this place of I have everything I need and I just want to do some good for the world. I want to help people. I want to contribute. And I asked myself, why did I get started in this business in the first place? I wanted to explore personal growth. I wanted to share that passion. That's why I started blogging. I didn't start blogging because I was trying to make money, not so much to build a business. I was already writing articles for five years before I started my blog, just a few articles a year, trickling them out while I was running my games business. And I did that for free entirely because I loved sharing ideas with people. So I got back to that, what was that purest intent? How can I get myself back to that? that purity of spirit, that um, place of letting go of all neediness and feeling I'm whole and complete right now, and what do I want to create? What do I want to experience? So having that, having that one simple practice, whatever it is for you. For a, a musician, it might just be, you know, grab your guitar and play your favorite song. 
or, or you know, do something that feels good to you. Create a new song and share it for free on SoundCloud or something like that. You know, just get back into that spirit of why did you get into music in the first place? I just wanted to write. I wanted to compose. I, I recently encountered a musician who, um, she was a singer, and she, she sung all these songs, and she sang beautifully, and she'd only composed one song, and, and she sang it for me, and I thought, that was a beautiful song. Why don't you do more composing? And, uh, she, you know, she loved doing it, but she'd gotten far away from that, that, that path with a heart that inspired her singing all everyone else's music instead of going back to composing. You know, what, what is it for you in doing your event? Why did you want to do this event in the first place? You know, this, this um, lifestyle convention. Yeah, Why, it's, it's, you know, I, What was it? It probably wasn't inspired by, I need to make money. It was probably something else. Like, I want to bring people together. Um, you no, know, I want no, to inspire it's, people. Absolutely. It was, uh, it, I, every day, I, it's just like, I just want to help people. Whatever I do, whatever I like, put energy in. It's just like it gives me such an amazing people to uh, feeling to help people out. It's it's just great, and I can just like the reason why I'm nodding like this is just because I I, I experience that every day. I made myself a little screensaver where it's just written. I want to help, and I, I'm like under the uh, under the logo of the convention. It's just I want to make it the best day. For the attendees, the speakers, and the helpers, and that's that's why I'm there, uh, and that that's why I, why I want to do this event, and I also believe that's why I I could create this energy on <laughs> doing something every day almost for this event is exactly because I, I feel like it it sounds a little bit stupid, but there is a higher purpose in this. I really I really want to help people out, and I think I completely agree. If if people get in tune with that. Wipe. Mm -hmm. Everything else will come. Everything else will come. And but but first you have to define that. And when you when you found it out for yourself, it, it's it's just completely magical. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I've 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 uh, been to events where the focus of the speakers and the organizers is clearly just on trying to milk the audience for as much money yes. as possible. Everybody gets up there and it's another sales pitch and. Their whole talk is basically just a setup for their sales pitch in the last five minutes. And you feel just the drain and the energy in the room where people just feel used and abused and they, do, they don't like being in that space and nobody's comfortable there. And I, at one of these events, every speaker, you know, like each speaker was maybe 30, 60 minutes and every speaker was doing these, you know, but wait, there's more and there are bonuses and showing the dollar value of everything they're putting into their big package that they're gonna sell at the back of the room for $300 or whatever. And it got to be so ridiculous after a while that the you could tell the speakers were getting embarrassed, you know, to go to be like the sixth or seventh speaker to do that for the day, and you know the the groans of the audience, which weren't really audible, but you could feel it energetically. And then compare that when you speak in an event where it's clear the speakers are there because they just want to help people and they want to make a difference. Um, I, I know you did a um, a webinar earlier with uh, Morton Hockey. And I, I've spoken at his event in uh, Oslo a couple times, and he has this great energy there. You know, the speakers aren't trying to sell, sell, sell. They're all just there because they want to help the people in the audience. And it creates such a better vibe for the room, and it inspires people. And then that's the kind of thing that generates lots of referrals. People want to, you know, go back. They want to bring their friends. They want to bring their family. Whereas with the other events, you know, there's going to be no word of mouth. People aren't going to refer anyone to it. They're not going to repeat it. It's just try to, like, uh, you know, try to milk people for money and then, run <laughs> you know, yeah. instead of uh, pro providing real value that will make things sustainable long term. Th that's the thing with a lot of events. I mean, I, I've met Morton as well, and we were talking about w what is what is the difference. I mean, we have a webinar now, right? And people can listen in, they can ask questions, like 0.05% we actually <laughs> answer. And um, what is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we're just talking about ourselves no, but I mean, what is what is the difference? Would you say if you if you go to a workshop or a convention um, compared to like watch YouTube, watching YouTube videos or or attending live webinars like this one is? I'd say the the main benefit is the social aspect, getting a chance to really meet other people. I did my first three-day workshop in 2009, and 
one of the things that surprised me about it was how much the attendees connected with each other. There were over 100 people there, and I, I, I thought, okay, it's just everybody's coming to see me as the speaker, and they're all going to sit mm -hmm. in their own quiet spaces, and you know, then they go home afterwards. And I didn't think there would be that much social interaction. But no, it was just the opposite. People were going to lunch with you know, groups of 20 or 30 people. They all made great friends. And many of those people from that, from that first workshop still know each other to this, to this day. There's probably some people on the call who are at that very first one. Um, so, you know, being able to just, uh, um, you know, connect with like-minded people and to and to share with them, that that is uh, usually people tell me that's about half the value of going to to live events. And once I realized that was happening, I designed the events to be a lot more social. So there's a lot of uh, you know, sharing of, in groups, small groups, and and exercises where people mingle around the room and get to meet a lot of people. Uh, I've even um, earlier this year, I actually went skydiving with a, a couple, a married couple, that met at one of my workshops. So I thought that's really cool. You know, that relationship wouldn't have happened if I didn't do that event. And uh, you know, there's been so many great groups of friends that have that have connected, and they they stay connected online. And if they travel around, they can go to different people's houses to stay. There's one guy here named Kevin who hosts uh, like a bazillion people at his house each time I do a workshop. <laughs> so it, it, it's 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 pretty cool to see that. I see Jeff Smith on here. Hey Jeff, <laughs> um, yeah, I think he was at the the very first workshop, right? Or at least a number of them. And yeah. uh, and it's it's really you know cool just seeing all those those long term friendships that developed. That surprised me in such a big way. I actually met my current girlfriend at my first workshop. Um, you know the the people that go to these events they tend to be really great connections for me socially mm -hmm. on a personal level. They they make great friends. I make some of my best friends, um, including my girlfriend at at uh, at these types of events because they have a lot in common with me. You know they. Um, very growth-oriented people, and so if you're, if especially if you're a single speaker and you're bringing everybody together who's been following you online for a while, then everybody's gonna have something in common with you, and because of that, they're all gonna have a lot in common with each other. So that's really kind of cool because people don't expect that so much. All, all that, think, uh, that instant friendship and how easy it is to connect with like-minded people. Yeah, that's. I think that's the main point. The thing is when you, uh, I think Spencer. Crandall uh, put it very well. He said, how, uh, how do you get abo above the noise? It's one big, big, big part of it is connect with like-minded people. And if you want to, if you want to be, if you want to be over average, if you want to do something special, you're very, very lonely a lot of times because everybody around you is in the, is like tries to put you down again, tries to put you in the, in that normal sphere of nine to five jobs, why should you quit your job, why should you do that, just stay the way you are and if you really want to grow, if you really want to go a step forward, I, I remember my my last few conventions, it was just such an accelerator to really finally not be the only guy that is interested in self-improvement and finally meet other inspired entrepreneurs and I think that that's the main reason also, the second main reason, not only the helping people, but also like getting like-minded people and to network. It's, it's so much fun if there is a lot of motivated people in one room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I once did a survey on my, uh, when I had discussion forums on my website, I ran some discussion forums for about five years, and they were, they were pretty popular, but, uh, got to be a bit too much to manage though. Uh, and one of, the, one of the questions I asked in a poll there was how many friends do you have that are into personal growth? And I think something like 60% of people said zero. They were the only person in their lives that they knew that was into personal growth. And yeah. another 20% said only one. And I think the, the category of like 10 plus people, you know, 10 plus friends that are into personal growth was, it, it was well below 10% uh, of the respondents, you know, had that many friends. And I thought, wow, I've got like, you know, a <laughs> hundred friends or so who are into personal growth, you know, that I that I, you know, connect with semi regularly on a first name basis, and I thought, wow, that's uh, really isolating. That so many of these people they don't know anybody else le like them. Um, but you know, I, for me, it's it, it's been a long term career path, so I'm very immersed in this field. But a lot of other people are just connecting with it over the internet. So having the opportunity to meet like minded people in person, it's it's really amazing 
people think they're so different and they have this tendency to you know isolate themselves, especially if you're around other people who make fun of you for being in a personal growth. Uh, but then you meet others who who they just get you instantly. They they get what you're about. You know they they understand the point of wanting to develop yourself and uh, you know wanting to keep working on on growing, becoming more conscious and having a happier life and finding find your own place of alignment with your path of the heart path mm -hmm. of the heart you find those people and you don't have to explain or justify they just instantly get you it's a beautiful thing I think that's that's the right moment to display my offer <laughs> <laughs> I will put that on the right side now. Um, guys, if you want to join uh, our convention, if you want to especially see Steve live, uh, you can do that in Switzerland at the 10th and the 11th of January 2015. You should now magically something appears on the right side of your screen, which is the offer. You can put uh, click on the button, sign up today, and you'll find all the details. Basically, it forwards you to, the, to our convention webpage. And if you guys feel like it, you can you can join us. Uh, the early birds tickets are available for three more days, I think. So it's a perfect timing for for uh, uh, that webinar that we have now, Steve. So if you feel like joining, it would be amazing. You will see Steve and other uh, amazing speakers live. Hug them, cuddle with them, maybe, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> most importantly, connect with them, uh, which you already mentioned, which I find the most amazing advantage of such events is to actually connect with people. It is in Zurich and so um, people from the US, you, you will fly in, I'm sure, and uh, what you talked about before, see if it's like the passion to travel connected with a, connecting with a trip is certainly a, a really cool thing to do, so if you guys feel like it, sign up. And yeah, back to the topic. Um, yeah, what I find amazing, what I just have to mention to the people is Steve Pavlina is coming to this event for free. Can you imagine that? I just pay him the flight and he basically comes to this event for free, so I, I find that really, really amazing. Thanks again for that, Steve. Sure. That, that also aligns with uh, you know my own path with the heart as I was figuring this out. For, for many years I was getting invitations to go travel long distances to speak at events, but you know often the events were, there were these multi-speaker events and they didn't have a budget for for paying the speakers, so they were drawing. After a while, hey, it's a you know it's a free trip to Europe. Why am I saying no to this? <laughs> so uh, it, the past few times I would go and speak at one of these events, and then I hang out in Europe for a month or longer afterwards. So I I, I did two trips to Europe last year, um, doing two different events, one in um, one in Berlin and one in Oslo, and that was a lot of a lot of fun. So I. Decided to say yes to these things more often, and now I'm getting you know invitations in other areas too, like South America. I got one for uh, I think uh, for Chile, so I might go there. Amazing! So, I'm jealous. <laughs> but lifestyle-wise, it sounded it seemed like a good thing to go travel more and uh, and uh, you know do speaking, which I love anyway. Yeah, real cool. Let's let's try to get a few more uh, questions in from the att uh, from the attendees of this uh, webinar maybe one or two and then we can wrap this up so um, I think well, somebody, asked if you're, somebody asked if you're replaying the webinar and you're gonna put yeah. it on YouTube afterwards right? yes guys we, we're certainly gonna replay the uh, we have a replay of the whole webinar it probably will take us um, may, maybe today and tomorrow to to put it on YouTube but everything is recorded already so you will have a replay page um, exactly at the same link where you are right now so no worries you can you can see the whole thing again and again and again and again and again, so that won't be a problem. Um, and about Steve will work for travel. Yeah, in a way, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm happy to provide for your travels. <laughs> you don't need to make as much money that way. Uh, my last trip to Europe, I I was there for five weeks, yeah. and I didn't have to pay for a place to stay once. I just sort of you know couch surfed or. Um, you know, made spontaneous connections along the way, made new friends, and ended up just you know always having a place to stay wherever I went, and that was a that was a lot of fun. So this time, um, uh, uh, Rochelle wants to go with me too, so I'll pay for her ticket, and uh, so we'll both be there. Oh, cool! Thanks. That's that's amazing. That's really cool. Okay, one last question. Um, how do you? I, I find that interesting. How do you distinguish between? We talked about focus before. 
Uh, how do you distinguish between being on the wrong path and just facing resistance? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, so let, let's say you 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 you're not sure whether what you well you you kind of answered it already before. If you're not sure whether you're on the path, you're probably not on the path. Yeah, I, I'd say. Um, one of my one of my friends, uh, a guy named Hans, who uh, coaches men to improve their social skills with women, mm -hmm. he, he has an interesting take on this, and he meets a lot of guys who complain about having approach anxiety. So, for instance, they see an attractive person on the street and they want to go walk up and talk to her, but they're scared and they talk themselves out of doing it. Mm -hmm. So he says, "Okay, you know." So he did, he decided to try helping people because he was getting all these people wanting to wanting help with uh, this approach anxiety problem, and he went out and he tried to help them and he found it wasn't really effective because by focusing on the resistance it just kept expanding and so he was trying to come up with these techniques and strategies for helping them, and eventually he just gave up on trying to help them overcome the resistance because it was it was putting their focus on the wrong things, and eventually he stopped and told these guys he said. Forget about this resistance stuff and this approach anxiety. He said, just answer me honestly. Do you love women? He's like, do you love women, yes or no? And the guys would be like, I, you know, I guess so. <laughs> they say, well, because if you love women, I can help you. If you don't love women, I can't help you. And what he was basically saying is that you need to put your focus past the resistance. You need to basically ignore the resistance and focus on and and, and Fixate your mind on building up what it is that really attracts you about that path. And dealing in, you know, am I on the wrong path? Am I feeling resistance? You're really just putting your mind on the wrong thing either way. I don't think it really matters. The, the, the answer to that question I don't think is really going to be helpful. I don't think it really matters. It's not a distinction I make. It's not something I really think about. A better mm -hmm. question is, what do you want? You know, or in Han's version, do you love women? You know, so if, you, if you're a man and you want to get better at connecting with women, then focus on your love for women. Because Hans just runs with that. And so he doesn't think about resistance or approach anxiety. They're not really a part of his reality. He just focuses on how, mu how much he loves women in general and how excited he is to go talk to somebody new and to get to know her better. And it's the same way when you're starting a new business. You know, what is it that you like? Uh, if you want to get into speaking, you know, I would ask, do you love speaking? Do you or do you love helping people? Do you love communicating? If you want to get into personal growth, do you love helping people grow? One of the, one of the things I dabbled in was was one on one coaching, doing uh, doing one on one coaching calls. I did that a few years ago, and I found I didn't really like it. So if you were to ask me, do you love coaching? I'd say you know I was actually pretty good at it. I definitely helped some people, but I didn't love it, and so I stopped doing it. And, but I love writing, and I love speaking, so I, I bet bigger on those things. I think if you're experiencing so much resistance that you can't find the love, then you know, either look around the resistance and say, is there a seed there that you love? Is it, you know, do you love being up on a stage in front of people? Do you love music? Do you love, um, do you love helping people in some area? Do you love working with technology? I still love programming. You know, I actually dabbled in, in uh, doing some programming just on the side project lately, just for fun, because I still love it. I, I like it. And so I don't feel that resistance there, because I look, I look past it to what I love. I think that's, that's really the deeper answer to that question, is forget about the resistance, forget about, you know, am I on the right path, am I on the wrong path? What is it you love? You know, look at that and magnify that, and just keep moving towards what you love. Forget about the resistance. I think that's a very nice ending <laughs> for this little webinar. Um, just one last question, uh, Steve. What can people expect from you at the convention next year? Well, they can expect that I'm going there to just share and have fun and connect. I don't need anything from everybody. I'll be there having a good time. I'll, I've never been to Switzerland before, so I'm happy to go. And I, I just want to be available for supporting people on their path of growth. So I'll be, I'll be, you know, content-wise, I'll be sharing um, more along the lines of what we, what we talked about here today, mm -hmm. especially following that path with a heart. So I'll be sharing some stories about that, how to find your path with a heart, 
how to stay on your path with a heart, and how to get past all that resistance, mainly by focusing on you know, what you can experience beyond that resistance, especially getting a lot of social support built in your life, like, like uh, eventually aligning your whole social sphere with the path that you want to be on. That's one of the biggest things I often talk about is helping people realign their social sphere with that path that they want to be on. Because so often people are, are stuck in that they have a very unsupportive social circle around them. Yeah. That's not going to support them on their new path. Absolutely. And I think a perfect start is to actually network with people that are like minded. Really cool. Yeah. That's one of the great things about a conference like this is that it automatically gives people instant friends and instant connection uh, with others who are very like minded. It, it gives you just simply a boost. Really cool, man. Thank you so much, uh, Steve, for uh, taking the time to help all those 222 attendees that we had. It's amazing. I'm still. Yeah, it's it's amazing how many people uh, were a part of this. Um, yeah, check out the Lifestyle Design Convention at www.lifestyle2015.com. And uh, yeah, make sure to be a part of it. If you want to uh, get updates, just like us on Facebook, the Lifestyle Design Convention. You will find us there. And yeah, I wish you all the best. Uh, enjoy life. If we see each other, I'm, I'm happy to see you in person, you guys out there, you girls out there. And thank you very much again, Steve. Thank you, Kai. It was fun.